And eventually I had to say, my people are going to trust it. The people that are right for me are going to trust it. And guess what? I'm going to fail at being fake and trying something that I'm not good at. So if I do what I enjoy, it's authentic and I find my people. This is Rebel Therapist, a podcast for entrepreneurs who are trained as therapists and who want to level up their businesses, make a bigger impact, feel fulfilled, and be very well paid. I'm your host, Annie Schusler. If you're wondering what kind of program you should create when you move beyond private practice and create your signature program, keep listening. Our guest has created a really unique program and she figured out its format by trusting herself. She had to move through the doubt and questions that so many of us deal with, like, is this enough? Am I enough? Our guest, Mishera, also talks about why she's retired her license. You're going to love her reasons, even if you know that you're keeping your license. Introducing the brilliant Mishera D. Winston, who you can find at MisheraDWinston.com. Mishera is a former adventure therapist who's passionate about the power of play. A self proclaimed play historian and cultural healthcare nerd. In her work, she helps communities celebrate the mental health care systems within their own cultures and helps healthcare professionals save their own lives. Mishera, welcome. I'm so excited. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) So, all right. I want to hear about Crave and how Crave came to be, how you created Crave. And I know you were telling me that Crave, which is for healthcare execs and caregiving professionals, this actually came from and came after Tribe Thrive. So will you tell us about Tribe Thrive, like where it exists, what it is and who it's for? Yes. Okay. So Tribe Thrive came to be because when I was younger, I noticed that when I got stressed out, I wanted to go outside and that that was helpful for me. Many years passed and I recognized when I did that with groups that they would say, oh, I feel so much better outside and I want to share about stuff all of a sudden. And I wasn't sure why, but people kept saying they wanted to do that. I learned that that's called adventure therapy and recreation therapy. So I got into the healthcare world as a a healthcare professional and a practice owner doing group adventure therapy. And I started noticing that what we now call adventure therapy, which is give people a positive experience that they find adventurous and pleasurable and playful, and they will then process through all sorts of stuff together with support from each other, that tribes and cultures worldwide have been doing that for thousands of years, getting together for pleasure, getting together for recreation and play. And that in that, people tend to afterward check on each other. They tend to be honest. I'm really struggling at work. My kid is acting a fool. I'm I'm wondering about my new marriage. I'm hoping for the best and I feel unprepared and yada, yada, yada. I've got these goals. And so that celebration that people are already getting together and that that's in our bodies, like even if we don't know, hey, this is good mental health care, that communal care is already in our bodies, led me to think about some of the ways that healthcare executives don't get to be body honest. And what I say that I mean is they don't get to be honest and say, I'm worried about my marriage. I am overworked. I am hopeful for this fun activity that I have over the weekend. Sometimes healthcare executives and healers of various types, caregiving professionals are not treated like they're human. They're treated like they are supposed to be a chronic and constant sense of inspiration and superheroism all the time. And like they don't get to have boundaries because what even is boundaries for a crisis professional when the world is in a constant state of crisis, like a three-year pandemic, for example. And so when those folks need to be able to 
have the fuel to go in their lives, I don't think that their pleasure and their play has been thought of as a source of good fuel and a valid, legitimate uh, way of spending their time that can be used to combat burnout, superheroism, um, being ran ragged, using exhaustion as a badge of honor. So since that was me, I'm I'm dragging myself right now. Since that was me, <laughs> who was just you know worn out. I thought, okay, how did I get back to a rejuvenated personal life so that I could even show up in my professional life or so that I could sh- shift in my prof- professional life? And what I needed was a state of rest and calm that is created when we step outside of, when we allow our bodies to not just live in a state of crisis, a state of exhaustion, a state of problem solving, a state of helping, but also giving. Givers need to actually be able to receive, like that's the practice lesson. And so Crave is a, it is a choose your own adventure, quite playful, body honest, follow your body, group coaching program. It is a coach. Does this, oh, I'm sorry to interrupt, Michelle. Does this scare the hell out of, because I'm thinking about like, my friend who's a surgeon, I'm thinking about my friends who are therapists, especially the group practice owners, like, does this scare the shit out of people? Yes, at first. This is what they <laughs> <Okay>. do. They <laughs> First, they email me and tell me, my friend really needs this. That's what they do. My friend needs this. My friend needs this. And then they're like, <laughs> but I can't give, I can't put you in contact. I am I am that uh, helping professional that for years had people sneak to therapy with me. And so they're like, no one needs to know. Here I am being playful with Mishera and a group. So first they say that, then they, they want to know more. They want to feel comfortable, which is absolutely to be understood they want me to tell them that they are allowed because sometimes people are not ready to give themselves permission to have a good thing because they think that pleasure, healing, and rest are earned. And that's not true. But yes, it scares them. And when I tell you like some of the lessons, the headings of the lessons we have in Crave, yeah, I'm sure you'll see why people are like, wait a minute, what? And then they're like, wait a minute, I need that. <laughs> So they, they're scared and there's something in them that senses like, yes, this is what I need. And, and you're saying this was you. And so in creating this, how did you, how did you figure out what need, what Crave needed to look like? Like kind of what the structure and what the flexibility, all of it, what it needed to be? I think it was, I think it was a mixture of Having worked with surgeons and and doctors and therapists and you know a variety of people as therapy clients for years as coaching clients for years, but it was also humility. And when I say that, what I mean is, I feel that we are all innately brilliant in terms of the the talents and the gifts and the things that we are just good at. But I also think that. No one can tell us about ourselves the way we can tell ourselves about ourselves. And I don't mean that with a critical eye, like dragging ourselves for filth and saying, look at you, you're failing. I mean, who am I to tell a surgeon or a doctor or a therapist, this is what your body's saying right now? I think we can kind of get into uh, an egocentric, you know, who is the wise guru? Who is the top surgeon on shift? And we don't have enough spaces where someone says, no, 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 I'm going to teach you to trust you. And when you make mistakes, who cares? Because it's play. There's no such thing as mistake play. I don't think we have enough spaces where it's like, I'm going to help you to listen when your body chooses your adventure and you're going to play in the way you want to play and you're going to report back to us. So the structure of Crave actually allows people to like, take photo, take video, take sound clips of themselves on their own treasure hunting discovery, because there's a lot of treasure hunt homework. And it's literally follow your body, 
see where it goes without a schedule, an agenda, without trying to please or save anyone, and then come back to the group and let's talk about it. And it's okay if you step out your door and have a, you know, a panic a little bit when you like burst into tears and realize, I don't know where to go for pleasure. I don't know what that looks like. Or when you turn around, walk back in the house and get in the bed, because what your body said is, I'm too tired for this ish. <laughs> like, And so being in a place where that is affirmed, like you did a great job with the homework. Now let's get into all those feelings of guilt or worry. Like, am I doing it right? Because that's a question I got from so many people. Am I doing it right? Am I playing right? And th- I think that lets us know there's work to be done in affirming these brilliant healthcare execs and caregiving professionals that we have in, yes, your body and your existence is enough. And here, you don't have to inspire us. Here, you get to be the receiver. You get to get the best standard of care that you try to get to everyone else. Mm, Yeah, I bet you must deal with a lot of pushback in that in that struggle of like, am I doing it right? What is the curriculum? Yes. Am I, you know, <laughs> that school training that we have, like, yes. I know even in my program, which is not in any way as, as playful, there's still a lot of, am I doing this right? Kind of like, do I get an A? And I just think we're so taught by our, our schooling, most of us, and so many other things we're taught this idea of like, am I getting an A? And so I'm just picturing for you, it must take a lot of, a lot of confidence and experience for you to like stay body honest in the face of all of these people kind of struggling through that. Absolutely. Well, what I, what I, I think that comes down to is us wondering over and over, am I enough? Am I enough? Do am I a healer that gets to be a human? And is that legitimate enough? I'm going to read you some reviews, two of them that came from folks that have done Crave, because I think you're speaking this on something really good about like how are folks feeling after our schooling? And then as you want, I can also share like here are the lessons that got people to this place. And you'll hear opportunities for that pushback. Oh yeah. <laughs> So we'll start with this mental health therapist. This person said, I think particularly in the health profession, it can be really hard, especially in these past couple of years in pandemic when we are running in crisis mode. It can feel really uncomfortable, dangerous, and lazy to feel any joy. Who am I as a healthcare worker to get to play? But in this program, you help people learn to play and to dream and to move through the discomfort that is dreaming. You help explore the play, the dreams and desires and make room for those things by believing us about our own body's cravings. You help us to honor ourselves through being believed. So that's one person. And I know sometimes people are like, therapists, they're so like fluffy clouds in the sky. And I know that's not true for therapists necessarily, but I'll also give it to you from a surgeon. (laughs) This is what this person says. (laughs) (laughs) They said, as a busy, overworked and exhausted physician struggling through a pandemic, Mishera and Crave was a salve to my soul. My best analogy is her work gave me 3D glasses that I needed to see myself, my needs, and my life clearly. Before working with Mishera, I was very successful in my career and in my life, but I always still felt internally in my body unsatisfied and out of control. Mishera's coaching shifted my worldview in a foundational way, and I stopped seeing my job as my only calling and started seeing myself as an asset to be protected. I stopped blaming myself for my frustration, allowing others to trigger me and ruin my day, my week, and my month. I instead began to understand and meet my needs for fuel and pleasure. 
Mishera and the 3D glasses changed my life in both tangible and intangible ways. And so I'm grateful for the changes I and my family have made as a direct result of the work. It is a heavy lift for some people. So Crave has one application question. I had more, but I realize when people are burnt out and people come to me when they're burnt out or they are trying actively to avoid it so they know they're getting close, they don't have the energy for a bunch of application questions. So I'm not giving them that because I know what it is to be burnt out and then to try to prove that you're good enough in the application to get care for your burnout. In just a moment, you're going to hear the one question Mishera asks in the application for the Crave program. First, I want to invite you to get on the wait list for Create Your Program. This is an eight-week process to expand beyond private practice. You're going to go from having an idea or even a bunch of great ideas to actually launching one pilot program. And that pilot, or otherwise, sometimes it's called a beta program, is the first step to creating a thriving business beyond private practice. This is a small group experience where you're going to get a lot of brave work done in a supportive group of open-hearted entrepreneurs like you. This is designed to have you launching a paid program at the end of our time together or soon after if you want to go at a slower pace. Folks are usually surprised at how much support they get from me and from the structure of this experience. This is for you if you're a therapist or a healer and you want to expand your business. Go to rebeltherapist.me slash create to learn more and get on the wait list. It's going to open up for registration in very early October and folks on the wait list hear about it first. The price for CYP is going to go up next time. So this is a great time to get in if it's something you know you want to do. All right, let's find out the one thing Mishera asks on the application for Crave, and then we're going to find out why she's retired her license. What is, what is the question you kept? And then I'm so curious what some of the questions are that you decided we can let these go. Yes. So actually I've already shared it. The question was literally, are you ready? When you said, I wonder if people, you know, if they, they struggle a bit, like, Oh, I don't know about this. And so I'm just trying to hear a yes. I'm like, yep, it might not be easy. But if you say yes to me, if I have consent from you, therefore you're giving, you you got the consent from your body. You're believing yourself. If you give me a yes to that question, are you ready? Then you're in. You will not prove your credentials to me because I already believe that you're brilliant. Not because of all of your training. I think you're brilliant because you've made it this far. You're alive in these times. You've managed to stay alive. Wow. So that is is the question. And I tell people like, once you get in, guess what? There won't be articles to read. Guess what? There will be no PowerPoint presentations. There will be no wear yourself out to do the homework for Crave. Nope. It's for folks who are tired and we're going to treat you like you deserve rest and care. We focus on leisure and rec. There, there is no, and now here's the the struggle for greatness with it. Nope. Nope. My outcome objectives are you feeling like the quality of your life is not reflective of what you can do for other people in the job. Mm, So it's purely like experiential. How did you, did you have to pare down and get rid of homework or did you always know this would be the structure? So a lot of this was me being body honest with myself. The truth of the matter is I am a kinesthetic and body-based learner. I'm not a visual learner. So who did, who would I think I was to beat people over the head with a text or a journal article when that is not even how I best receive information. I don't always receive it best from speaking or listening. I receive it through doing. So I created a program that I knew I could sustain because it's within my learning style. And I knew that seeing 
us all together and all these visual components was going to get my visual learners. And us coming together, there's a lot of audio, would take care of my audio folks. And for my doers, instead of us thinking, oh, we'll get to you know our learning style when we get to the field trip part, which is how I felt in school a lot and would misbehave because I'm like, I'm sitting here <laughs> waiting to start learning and it hasn't happened. Yeah. Like, nope. From the beginning, we're engaging these learning styles in ways that are nourishing and pleasurable. <gasps> I'm having such a like buzzing in a good way moment <laughs> of like, so in my program, which is called Create Your Program, sometimes people are wondering like, what should my program format be? Like, what's the right program program format? And I give people some guidance on how to choose that, how to decide what to include. And the biggest job I feel like I have with people around actually creating their programs is to trust their inner wisdom, that I think they already have the best program inside of them. And so it's really about helping them tap kind of back into that rather than trying to copy what somebody else has done or follow somebody else's blueprint. Now they need a lot of help around the marketing. They need a lot of help around the niching. But when it comes to the program, I think our inner wisdom often along with all of that life experience and all of that, you know, working experience has the right answer. So I just feel like this, what you have created is such a beautiful example of that. Like nobody else could have told you this is what you should create. It came from you. I appreciate that so much. And I want to, I want to admit transparently that it took me a while to get there because of that question that I said earlier, which is, am I enough? Is this good enough? I knew my work was powerful because people kept telling me my work was powerful, but I didn't know, well, you know, who's going to sign up for a coaching program that doesn't have a, you know, completely concrete curriculum when when if someone actually says, you know, choose your adventure, follow your body, and here are the topics, who's going to trust it? And eventually I had to say, my people are going to trust it. The people that are right for me are going to trust it. And guess what? I'm going to fail at being fake and trying something that I'm not good at. So if I do what I enjoy, it's authentic and I find my people. Yeah, but I had that same fear. I I don't have any type of email connected, for example, like people send in their applications via email is how some programs work and that's valid. I don't take applications that way. I take them via an audio app because it's easy for me to be like, hey, what's good? Are you ready? And for someone to say, yeah, I'm ready, done. That Ooh, that's so radical. I love it. Base for me, that's the leisure rec way of me having people apply. That's my leisure rec way of, of screening people. Because I feel like when people see the playfulness in my marketing, if they don't want to do, if they, if they think that play is just so not worth their time and following their own bodies and being body honest is such a, you know, a bunch of foolishness, foolery, foolishment, they're not going to apply. So I don't have to worry about people coming in and really devaluing the space. I Something that I notice folks come with, sometimes they are unsure like what nourishing hobbies and pleasures are even active in their lives. And so by the time they get to me, I in, engage with and end up really enjoying this time with folks who are ready to get unstuck from their heads and get into their bodies because they've realized that while the head can do incredible things, it's not rejuvenating their life. And so when I ask that question, what active pleasures give you fuel on an everyday or every week basis? And they're like, yikes, I don't know. Then it's like, are you ready to find out? And for some people they're like, no, that's not important. They're not going to stay in communication with me. And I'm going to say that's okay. Cause there's so many great programs. So I'm real good at what I do, but I don't feel like, you know, I, I'm in competition with the next person. I'm like, no, I, I'm great at what I do. That's right. That's right. That's enough. Mm. And so then how do people usually find you who end up signing up for Crave? 
they find me through word of mouth. They find me because doctors and surgeons and therapists tell, tell their coworkers, tell their friends who they went to school with. There's a part in my marketing where I say like, balance boundaries and body honesty after the boot camp of school, the battle for your boards and the burnout that's normalized. And that's the the whole dang healthcare profession <laughs> sometimes. And so they're like, wait a minute, who do I know that went through the boards? Who do I know that's on rotation with me, had that boot camp of school? So word of mouth and then also social media, I have found those are the ways. What's your main social media platform? Do you have a primary one? Yes. Is it Instagram or? Yes, it is Instagram. I love your Instagram, by the way. So Thank yeah, tell you. us what it is. Thank you so much. I am Mishara D. Winston on Instagram and on Facebook and on Twitter. But I love playing on Instagram the most because I can just take a snapshot of me honestly looking silly and ridiculous in my, um, <laughs> what do you call it? My swimming cap playing in the water because the gag is I can't swim, you know, and I have a large Afro that is braided down right now. So when it's out, it gives the swim cap a whole ridiculous look. And so the Instagram reflects, y'all I'm playing, I'm, I'm investing in, in the quality of my life. And I'm teaching you how to do this in ways that are intentional and are nourishing and are really thought out through the history of adventure therapy and rec therapy, et cetera. But I'm not going to be on Instagram, you know, pretending that my, my Afro fits right in my, <laughs> my swimming cap. Cause it doesn't, it just looks silly. Awesome. Awesome. And how, like what, what percentage roughly would you say of folks find you through a referral as opposed to through some other way hmm. who end up signing up for Crave? For Crave. You're okay. So referral versus, I would say, oh, I'm going to say like over 60%. I would say reach out to me through I would say through referral because people start following me, but what they do is they kind of lurk and they don't say much. And then they don't say one comment. They just tag a doctor they know. They don't say anything else to the doctor. They just tag a therapist that they know. And then I get like a, you know, how do I apply? And, and we keep it like that. Some people are very like under the table with it. So at first, I didn't accept DMs, but now I know that I have the capacity to engage with folk in the DM who are like, I want to go ahead and apply. And I'm like, click the link. You'll hear audio, you know, from me. You say your answer and you're done. You're in. Oh, so cool, Mishara. What is the, the app that you use for that, for that audio thing? I use Marco Polo because it's ease based for me. I have loved ones around the world. I am not a person who's currently living in the United States of America. And so it really helps me when I am wherever I am to connect with people. Will you tell us some of the topics in Crave? Absolutely. So there's play as brain and nervous system care, how, why, and where to play when the world feels like it's burning. There is processing difficult reactions to the word pleasure and play, which is basically increasing our range for joy and play despite the discomfort. There is intellectualization as a defense mechanism. So basically the way that us very smart people avoid our emotions and our expression and our embodiment by being like, but is there a study? <laughs> as uh -huh. <laughs> Oh my gosh. You're just like, I see you. I see you. I see you. Oh my gosh. Yes. Refusing urgency, deprioritizing grind culture and savior culture as a full-time caregiving professional, saying no to superheroism. So saying no to being a chronic advocate and constant inspiration in your work, your marriage, your parenting, and your friendship and the internet 24-7 saying yes to reciprocal, guilt-free, nourishing relationships, 
and experiencing the nervous system regulation of being a giver who instead chooses to receive. The last one is support to live this as a regular imperfect community member without isolation. So it's basically like we're going against a lot of cultural work norms so that you don't end up being a robot or a a shell of a person because you're so good at the job, but you're not feeling so good in your body and your larger life and having like a, a group that normalizes that care and takes care of you as well, taking care of ourselves. Why did you retire from being a mental health licensed professional, which I did too, by the way. So I can think of a lot of good reasons, but. (laughs) (laughs) I think wide, big picture. And I think about what feels good for my body. What I noticed is that the idea that we are going to have individual mental health therapists for every person who really does need it and deserve care, individual care for multi-generational trauma, when we have whole cultures, whole blocks and whole neighborhoods that need and deserve support, I realized that just was not, our current healthcare system model to me did not feel accessible, sustainable or affordable. So I thought to myself, so I'm a Black person, and within the various cultures that I am in, I thought, what is the point of me going to therapy if no one else that I love, care about, or work with is going to therapy? And and not to say that people don't appreciate and enjoy therapy, but I'm saying, you know, I'm, I'm from the hood. And so I was like, my mama ain't going. My cousins aren't going. The hood's not coming. Why is that? I believe that we already have mental health care systems that have not been credited and have not been nourished as the beneficial resources that they are. And I wanted to point people in a direction that took labor and burden off of our struggling healthcare system. And I wanted to do that in a way that lifted up those healers, but also said, you know who else is a healer? Everybody on this block. Everybody is good at something. So I want to empower the people. And I do that through the Tribe Thrive Archive. But I also want to take care of and help these healthcare execs take care of themselves. And I do that through Crave. And I realized that I was a healthcare professional that was worth that same nourishment. And so I was not going to stay in patterns of working that ended up with, by the time I retired my license, I was one of two Black queer women licensed therapists in my entire U.S. city. So who am referring people to when I had, and I also, I was in a city that had a lot of like conservative faith ideas. And that is not how I at all approach mental health care. So when folks were like, I would like a therapist that has some of these lived experiences, I was like, I know one, and I do mean one, (laughs) who is licensed. And perhaps my network wasn't big enough Perhaps people were too afraid to say I'm queer and be out professionally, or I am firmly with uh, black and brown people. I am firmly with all types of people getting to thrive in this life, but it was burnout. It was a recipe for burnout. And when I retired my license, I saw that the other professional I referred people to moved to a whole nother city and state. And there was another person and that person said, I'm going to become a realtor. So I was just like, okay, this isn't working when we have so many people of my own neighborhood, of my own family who cannot see me for therapy because that is not appropriate. Who am I referring these people to? I realized that we don't have enough black, brown and indigenous to the land therapists because we are running out of folks that are willing to be trained in Uh, healthcare norms that do not even necessarily resonate with their culture, do not honor uh, their cultural knowings and, or are not sustainable, affordable, and accessible for that reason. But what we do have in Western healthcare, I think does have value, but it doesn't have value if we burn up, burn out, burn up all of our healers and healthcare workers. 
So I didn't want to be a part of the cycle that was actually harming my body. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much for going into this. All right. So Mishara, I'll give your URL in the show notes. And if someone's just walking along right now and they're like, I need to get into this, what's the first step? They can simply get on Instagram, Mishara D. Winston. Mishara, you know, it's in the show notes how it's spelled. Send me a DM. You don't have to read through all of my Instagram. You don't have to engage with posts. You don't have to go read that website with the pretty pictures and all those words. Who has the energy? Not you. Don't worry about it. (laughs) Send me a DM that says, I want the question. I'll send you the question you're in. That's it. And so like the pricing is on the website, um, but I've also got a slide that I can just throw in that same DM as a picture. It's very simple. It's very easy. I love it. Thank you so much, Mishara. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for giving me a chance to speak about this. You can find out more about Mishara Winston at MisharaDWinston.com. I want to thank Cosmo Palms, our editor. And if you found this episode supportive, please share it with your favorite therapist or healer. That is absolutely how we reach more people. And if you have a minute or like 30 seconds, if you could give us a five-star review on the app you're listening to this on, that also really helps us get more people's ears on the podcast. Thank you so much for listening and I'll be with you next time.